I quickly want to mention some additional aspects, mainly because you will sometimes just see this in code and I want you to know just um, what, what it does. So the first one of these is something called a windowing. And actually I've been using it throughout this whole, um, this whole notebook. Uh, let's just jump to the start here. Here you can see I do this W and then instead of calculating FFT, dot FFT of X, I actually do X multiplied with W. Okay. So, so really what I'm doing is I'm calculating the, the output of a new signal. I don't know, let's call it X dash, um, which is really the original signal X N multiplied by W N for each of the samples, right? Uh, so for, um, N equal to zero one up to my, the length of my, signal. Okay. Um, and I do that bef before I take the FFT. Let me just show you why we do this. So let's just start by first plotting um, the spectrum of a 300 hertz signal. Okay. And here I do this windowing and I use a window called the Hamming window. Um, and I basically do this equation here and that's just done there. And I do that before I, I um, calculate the FFT and you've got this nice peak. We've talked about the log before, so I'm just going to plot this um, on the log scale. So we're going to have the amplitude in log. Okay. And it looks like this, and this is a 300 hertz signal and you can see this very nice boom peak at, at 300. Now let's take out the window. Okay. And the window is just, um, I'll, I'll show you what the window looks like in a second, but let's take out the window and then calculate the FFT again. Now this is what it looks like. Okay. Um, in short, it looks a little bit disgusting, right? So I don't want to go into the full details here, but what a window does is it basically weighs your input signal in a way so that when you calculate the FFT, the result is a little bit better behaved. And that's all I want you to know. Um, I can show you, show you quickly what that, um, what the window actually looks like. Let's just plot it just without doing fancy stuff. Remember this is, it's discrete values, right? It's just a sequence of numbers that I'm weighing my input with. There's a sequence. So you start at 0 0.08 and then you go up to one and go down again. And by weighing the input like this, before you, um, before you actually calculate the FFT, you're getting a much better behaved um, FFT. And actually, normally, um, windowing actually happens already as part as, of the short time Fourier transform. So it's already incorporated into that process. Okay. The other thing I wanted to talk about quickly is uh, pre-emphasis. So pre in, pre in a pre-emphasis filter, um, what we're doing is we're doing something to the, basically the frequencies of, of the signal. So very quickly, what a pre-emphasis filter does is it's a little filter, um, where you take the current sample and you subtract alpha times the previous sample. Okay. And then you get out a new signal in code. It's literally this one line. Okay. And we normally use a alpha of 0 0.97. It's one, one thing. So let's quickly just, all we're going to do is we're going to plot the spectrum of a sound with and without the pre-emphasis filter. Okay. So let's quickly listen to it. Um, this is what this input sounds like. A. Okay. A. Cool. We've actually seen this spectrum before. It looks like this. Cool. Now we're going to repeat this, but we're going to first take X and replace that with a um, new X which will be pre-emphasis of the signal with a coefficient of 0 0.27. This X here, this will now, be, it's like the Y on the, on the slide here. Okay. So let's do that. Let's just, just rerun it. And this is the output. Now those two plots, I'm not sure I'll be able to get it. Let's see if I zoom out a little bit. Um, those two plots look pretty similar, but what you can see here is that here, uh, the frequencies have basically moved up a little bit. So we've yanked, uh, check that peak there, corresponds to that peak there, that peak there. Huh? Okay. You see that part has lifted up and actually this whole tail end has, has lifted up. Now, 
what a pre-emphasis filter does is, ex is exactly what we see here. It takes the higher frequency components here and it basically yanks them up a little bit so that they're on the same scale as um, the lower frequency components. And this is something that our ears also do again um, at a high level, at, at a very high level. Normally the amplitudes at higher frequencies are just lower, but we're still quite sensitive to what happens there. So the pre-emphasis filter is just something to um, basically push up those, um, those higher frequency components. And on this diagram here, normally what you would have is you would have the pre-emphasis filter basically applied to the signal before you actually go through the other steps. Last thing that I want to talk about is something called mal frequency capsule coefficients. And this is other type of features. Instead of using log mal scale spectrograms or, or filter banks, you can sometimes see people using mal frequency capsule coefficients. Now mal frequency capsule coefficients they actually just add two more blocks to the um, to this pipeline here. Um, so let's let's just add them, and the blocks are actually pretty simple. The first one is uh, they take the discrete cosine transform. I mean, you can go and read on the Wikipedia what the equation is for the discrete cosine transform. Okay, and then what they do is they just keep lower dimensional values. So maybe you just keep the EG 13 uh, first dimensions. So the DCT gives you, um, again, some vectors and you just keep the, um, the lower um, dimensions of, of that result. And what comes out of this block is your MFCCs. I don't want to go into all the reasons for doing this, but I want you to know that, that this is some, something that sometimes happens. All I want to say is that these, this process here, again, is something that is motivated loosely based on what happens in the human ear. And specifically what it does is it removes some information that uh, we might also see the brain actually removing. And you can see that by, since it drops some dimensions, it basically doesn't keep all the information and it's loosely motivated again by something that our ears do. So that part there, that part is uh, the MFCC part. Okay, so you'd add those um, few steps. Uh, and here in the little notebook, I just calculated the MFCCs again um, for, for one of the utterances that we've been looking at. You can see that you need to specify basically the number of mal bands. So you need to specify how many filter banks you have there, um, hop length, all of these things you again need to specify to get your mal frequency coefficients out. Um, and then in the end you get a plot like this. Now it's actually, uh, I don't think anyone can read mal frequency coefficients, maybe I'm wrong. Um, so it's much harder to actually um, just look at the coefficients and see what's going on compared to um, the filter banks. Um, but this is something that um, people often use in speech recognition. There's a very, very last thing and I quickly want to mention here, and this is delta and delta delta features, which is um, really only used with MFCCs. Um, but I'm just worried that you see this in a paper and you're like, okay, the speech features video didn't explain delta and delta features. So I'm very, very quickly intuitively going to um, to just talk about this. It's just with MFCCs, uh, I think. Um, so here what we have is, here we've got our uh, MFCC vectors, right, which comes out at the bottom here. And these are normally 13 dimensional, it's very, very typical. But uh, what people have found is that these features actually don't capture enough about how um, the speech is changing over time. Remember, each of these are basically based on a little window, but this window here might actually be affecting the subsequent window and so on. So what they did was they came up with a pretty clever idea to just hack these features to capture basically the change between your MFCC vectors. Um, and how it works, it's, it's super simple. Um, what they do is you basically calculate the difference between, for example, this one and this one, and you just plot it there, okay? And then you take the difference between um, this one and this one, and you put that there, okay? 
and the difference between the next one and the next one. Okay, cool. And so on. Okay. These are called delta features because it's basically telling you um, how the features are changing um, across uh, across time. Um, sometimes it's called the uh, velocity coefficients because it's basically telling you how quickly you're going, um, changing from one vector to the, the other vector. Uh, then there, what you can do is, of course, you can repeat that process and just calculate the deltas on top of the deltas. Okay, right? So you take this one and this one and you calculate the difference and um, again stack that, what we call the delta deltas. Okay, I'm just going to add the orange one here and the orange one here. For the first orange ones and the first red ones, you need to make some assumptions about how you're going to calculate them. Okay. Um, but this is often used with MFCCs. And if you have 13 dimensional um, static coefficients, the kind of the default, then you're going to have 39 dimensional um, vectors if you include the deltas and the double delta features. And for your system, what you end up doing is you just basically end up combining all of them into a single vector. And then that's the vector that you use in your speech system. So I hope with that, that you have a pretty good handle on how you would get speech features from a, a signal that you've got on your computer. And hopefully this does give you the base so that if you want to um, just explore speech processing in uh, the machine learning land, and maybe you already have a lot of experience with other machine learning type of models, that this gives you sufficient information to get going with, um, with speech.